Sky Sydney, Festival Director of AFI Docs, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to the Catalyst Sessions. Um, some of you have been with us already from an earlier session. Thank you for continuing on. It's certainly going to be an extremely enlightening day. Um, the Catalyst Sessions are, it's an idea that the films in the program can serve as, indeed, a catalyst for some of the most urgent issues of our time. And that rather than simply have, although they're very important, Q&As with the filmmakers following the screening, where we talk about everything from the craft itself of that film, that we take a, a moment um, in another environment to really unpack the issues at the heart of some of these extraordinary documentaries that we showcase at the festival and beyond. It's particularly significant for us in this, in this year, our 11th year, where the festival is embarking on an extraordinary transformation with our new presence in Washington, D.C., um, to be able to have these conversations literally steps away from the Capitol building and indeed steps away from the White House where the American Film Institute was in fact created over 50 years ago. So our return, so to speak, is both symbolically and literally um, very significant for us. Um, before moving into the panel and talking about it, I do want to acknowledge um, some significant supporters who have made the entire festival possible and the Catalyst Sessions possible in particular. Beginning with Audi of America, the festival's new presenting sponsor, who are certainly behind this very exciting expansion for the festival. We are indebted to them. ABC News for their support as our national media sponsor. Verizon and Marisa Mitrovich in particular for their support of this year's festival in general in our education initiatives and the Knight Conference Center for enabling us to have these dialogues in such an exquisite space. However, I really want to take a moment to significantly acknowledge the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Uh, this session was not only inspired but profoundly shaped by their extraordinary work on education and on the high school dropout crisis in particular. Hopefully, most of you know that public media plays a significant role in building individual ac activity, community capacity, and national awareness. And CPB's American Graduate Initiative is a long-term public media commitment aimed to help communities implement solutions to the high school dropout crisis. Thus, this afternoon's Catalyst session asks the question, what is the future of education? And the film at the center of this dialogue is Bernardo Ruiz's The Graduates. This new series explores pressing issues in education today through the eyes of six young Latino and Latina students from across the United States. The Graduates is not only a story about how Latino students are faring in our nation's public, public education system, it is also a story about the graduates who will make up America's future. The film is in the final stages of post-production and will premiere this fall on Independent Lens. Our moderator is Lindsay Layton, a writer on the national staff of the Washington Post. She's been covering national education since 2011, following everything from parent trigger laws, to poverty's impact on education, to the shifting politics of school reform. Lindsay came to the Post in 1998 and has covered a variety of beats, including food safety and chemical policy, Congress, transportation, and the US invasion of Iraq. She's a graduate of Wesleyan University. Please help me give a very warm welcome to Lindsay Layton. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for taking some time out to, to be with us and to view the clips that we're going to present and talk about this very urgent and important issue, uh, high school graduation rates and dropout, the dropout crisis um, in America. I'd like to just take a second to introduce to you the panelists that, we're going to, that are going to join us. Um, we're, going to, we're going to focus on some work that is still in production that's, uh, that's done by Bernardo Ruiz, who's a filmmaker who is uh, producing two one-hour documentaries for uh, the public media initiative American Graduate. And uh, as we heard, it's still in production. He just told me that uh, they're waiting for a couple of, of more graduation ceremonies in New York. They're still filming and putting the finishing touches on it, so uh, we won't be able to see it 
in its entirety, but we have some very provocative excerpts from, from uh, the film that, that we're going to view today. So we've got Bernardo Ruiz, um, and we will also be joined by Sarita Brown, who is the president of Excelencia in Education, which is a national nonprofit that uh, works to accelerate success for Latino students uh, in, in higher ed specifically. Um, and we are also going to be joined today by Dennis Van Rokel, who is the president of the National Education Association. It's the largest teachers union in the country, 3.1 million members. It's also the largest labor union in the country, and he has a very interesting perspective on, on some of the issues facing his members um, in schools around the country. So if we can give a warm welcome to those three panelists, we can invite them all. To start off, um, Bernardo, if you'd like to introduce the clips that we're going to see sure. and give us a little background on the project, um, why you undertook it, and what we're going to view, that would be terrific. Sure. Um, I just want to say thank you to AFI and to Silver Docs to Sky for the invitation. It's, it's great to be here. This is a, an extraordinary festival, so it's great to be here. Um, I'm over-caffeinated and underslept. I just got in at 4 o'clock in the morning, so if I speak quickly, I apologize. It's not that I'm crazy. I'm just in the middle of production and drinking a lot of coffee. Um, the series is called The Graduates, and I'd be happy to discuss it in detail and how it intersects with some of the, the work that both of these folks are doing up here. Um, I would just say the, um, the, the intention of the series is really to look at the obstacles, challenges, uh, roadblocks to the, education, to the educational success of Latino students across the country. Basically, what's, what's going wrong, and then what can we do to support this population of students that um, you know, we can no longer ignore. Um, so it's two one hours. Uh, we're looking at six different districts across the country. Um, also trying to look at the diversity of the Latino community. Oftentimes in media, the Latino community has been uh, painted as one monolithic uh, block. It's obviously not. So part of the, one of the goal of this series as well was to look at um, how, how diverse um, and in interesting this, this community is. So um, what we'll see is a very brief show teaser showcasing the six students that we profile, followed by a short clip that was produced by um, uh, our, one of our lead producers, Pamela Aguilar, about a young woman in the Bronx who's been, whose family has been in and out of shelters um, as, and, as, as she's trying to figure out where, where she's going to go um, educationally. So that's, that, that's what we'll see in the clips. Yeah. When I go going around my neighborhood, it brings back memories. Most people didn't even think I would go to age 18 because I was really deep into the game. Stuff I'm going through at home, I'm trying to like forget about it when I come to school. Lately, it's been hard. Having like people bully me, when it against me, because I'm okay. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think I can wait until the fall to see that. <laughs> I want to know what happened, what happened. So uh, we're just going to have to bide our time. Um, but that it's really intriguing work. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, I just want to take a second and uh, read off a statistic and ask, ask our panelists um, a question to get this going. Um, in 2010, the national high school graduation rate was 78.3%. That's 78.3% of kids who started high school finished on time. And that's the best rate in almost 40 years. Okay. Um, the last high water mark was 75, was 1975. So the national dropout rate, that's the, you know, the, the rate at which kids leave school during their 
during their four years fell to 3% after it had been stuck at 4% for, for about seven years. So to me, this seems like we're headed in the right direction, right? We've got a 40-year high in graduation rates and, uh, and we're dropping in the dropout rate. So do we have a crisis? Is there a, a dropout crisis in this country in, at this time? I'd like you each to, to take a swing at that. Tell me what you think. Sarita. Well, I think that uh, the good news is we are headed in the right direction. Um, I think the word crisis is useful as it relates to the trajectory for anyone uh, who, met, who attempts to manage a life without a high school diploma and for us without some college. Uh, we live now at a time when the environment, the world, um, the jobs require those kinds of skills. So I think against the benchmarking of national data, we're on the upswing, and that's very good news. And it's critical to those students, it's critical to our country. But the trajectory for our country really is much higher expectations of our educational system. Bernardo, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly share what I've learned in, in the field, you know, and that's about a, a year and a half of touring six different districts, you know, from rural to urban. Um, and I think that, you know, the question I always have as a filmmaker, because I'm most interested in people and, you know, in the kind of human stories on the ground, and that's um, what's, what's the quality of that education, number one, and have, what have, have we done enough to erase poverty and inequality? And I think from my perspective, the answer is no. Um, you know, we also recently um, have learned that college enrollment is up for la Latino students, which is absolutely a positive. But again, you have to complicate those stats and say, well, what's the, you know, what, what kinds of universities or colleges are these students going to? Are these selective universities? Are these two-year schools? What, what are the completion rates there? So I think, you know, when the, the stats are up like that, it is, um, it is affirming, it is a positive, but we have to question, you know, what, what the quality of that education is like, um, and also what's, um, you know, what, what types of futures are we putting these students into once they are educated? What, what are they going to go out into the world and do? What are we preparing them for? Um, passing, being passed through a series of grades and being pushed out of a school and then going out into the world where you, you are uh, untrained and, and unable to find a job is not necessarily a hopeful future. So what, what, what kind of world are we putting them out into as well? Dennis. I would answer the question is yes, we have a crisis. Number one, it's not just a 60-year high, it's an all-time high of what's needed in the 21st century to be either career or college ready. And so the, it's just not enough. Uh, the second factor is when we just look at the overall graduation rate, it's a single piece of data that is very misleading. Because when you do the look at the different subgroups within that, it's not 78% of white, 78% of African American, 78% of Hispanic. It's very different. And we need to look at that subgroups. And it's an equity question. It would be great if 78% of all groups were 78%, and then we were working forward. But it isn't. And I believe that is at a crisis level. Uh, one of the things that I always point to is on the international assessment called the PISA. All the stories talk about that the United States ends up somewhere in the middle. But what they don't talk about is that if you look at American students that go to schools where there is less than 10% poverty, we're number one in the world. So it's not just an issue of excellence, it's an issue of equity. And that part is we are still way behind and it is at a crisis level. Bernardo, I want to piggyback on something that you mentioned, which was um, what's going on with the Latino population. Um, between 2006 and 2010, the Hispanic graduation rate grew from 61% to 70, 71%, so it's a 10% jump. Um, and also, African Americans made progress from 59% to 66%. So, and as you say, they're enrolling, Latinos are outpacing whites in terms of college enrollment now for the first time ever, which is really pretty interesting. And you're raising questions about the quality of that education, but I just wonder what's happening in the community to help boost those rates? What, what's being done right? Uh, 
uh, and Sarita, do you have you have some thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think part of it is something that we've long predicted, and that is just the proportion of the American society that is Latino. So um, that's happening. The other is that there has always been a passion uh, for education. Um, that is one of the characteristics. Um, it's not exclusive to Latinos, but the desire for Mijo to, to do better um, is driving a lot of that. And then I think there are communities and institutions across this country that are uh, very much uh, in sync with the kinds of things that, that have already been shared. Um, they've anticipated this potential student population and have done the kinds of simple, straightforward, welcome mat activities uh, to be very clear that you're welcome. If you're a, a, a working student with dependents, we still want you. Um, if you have financial need, we know how to deliver it. Um, if you're someone who wants to go to school 24-7, um, we can do that. There are institutions like that across this country. It's not a novelty. Uh, the question is really, is there will in our public systems? Is there will within the communities where Latino students reside? Because another characteristic is that for good or for bad, we do like to stay close to home. I mean, uh, you're using a lot of statistics. Latino students choose to go to school within 50 miles of where they grow up. We can talk about changing that. We can talk about going to Harvard and Yale, and we should. But we also need to meet students where they are. And with internet available everywhere, we need to provide that. We've got the means to do it. Bernard, do you have some thoughts? I do. I mean, I, I think I would still question the, you know, the quality of, of those statistics. I mean, you know, to, to, to steal a line from the wire, you can always juke the stats, right? I mean, you can, <laughs> and I'm not saying that those statistics have been juked. I'm just saying that we do have to interrogate those, and you know, journalists do this all the time. You, you have to interrogate the quality of those statistics. Um, and one of the things that we tried to do in, in, in the series, and Sarita and I were talking about this before, is there, there's so much um, negative, uh, there's such a kind of a negative image of the Latino community still and um, Latino students in general, that one of the things that we tried to do here in the series is to tilt towards success stories and not in a Pollyanna way, but to just look at what's, what's actually working. One of the organizations that we profile in the series is a college prep organization called Reality Changers that works with a lot of uh, uh, formerly gang-involved youth, some formerly incarcerated youth, and is uh, sending these students to college in, in record numbers. And part of what they do is just, they, they, it's, it's a very, there's no magic formula. You know, we, we love to throw out words like innovation and, you know, but it's, it's just really about hard work and it's really about keeping the students busy and really, um, really, really kind of pushing them, re resetting, resetting goals. So they've been a very successful organization. Um, you know, in Chastity's story, it's a children's aid society school where there's really comprehensive college prep support. So obviously, if you're coming from a low-income community and you are unable, uh, there are people in your life that aren't, uh, you know, don't have the resources to put you on that path towards college, then that's, that's where an organization like Children's Aid, in this particular case, is able to, to really support a student. So there are all kinds of really um, wonderful organizations doing work across the country. The question is what can be done you know, with, within schools uh, as well, and what can be done to support families as well. well Dennis, one, of, please. one of the things that I, I think is so important, if you look at teachers in general, I was a high school math teacher for 23 years, and, I'm a, and I look over my career at all the different teachers I've met, most of us are either first generation college in our families or we're teachers' kids. Those are the two primary sources for teachers. And what I find, especially in the Latino community, where it's really happening is when those who go to college come back to the community as teachers. I spoke to a Hispanic Leadership Institute, and there were thousands of these oh, just incredible young people who are in college. And I talked about leadership skills, but then I said, what I really need from you as a leader is to go be a teacher. They need to see you in the classrooms. The Latino population and students is the fastest growing, but it's not the fastest growing group within the teaching profession. We need to change that. And I think that's the concept of staying close to home uh, that complements that. Because when they come back into their community, uh, it, it's a, such an inspiration to young students. And I, I think that's a real positive trend that's going on. You know, um, just up the hill, uh, they've been debating the um, the, the new version of No Child Left Behind, the main federal education law. And um, the, yesterday, the House Republicans 
uh, committee passed its version, uh, which calls for a really a hands-off approach. So the federal government back off, you know, let the districts and let the states innovate and uh, and have control over K-12 education to a larger extent. Um, the Senate Democrats have. Uh, did their business the week before where they said the federal government should have a, um, a significant role in oversight. And I just wonder what is the appropriate federal role in this whole discussion? What should the federal government be doing to address these issues? Thoughts, Sarita? You know, it's, um, I want to get it done. And so for me, um, Whatever I might say about the federal role, uh, I don't want to alienate uh, a part of America that somehow has decided that things in Washington are broken and that we're not going to do it. I've worked in an administration. Administrations are made up of people. They advance ideas. It's a mechanism. Um, I do think that at this moment in time, there is a lot of clarity about what a good school looks like, what it takes for young people to thrive and what kinds of needs can be met. Um, and so I am not going to duck the premise that uh, the Common Core is a good approach to making sure that people understand what students need to be able to do when they graduate and what it looks like to be college ready. Um, but to, um, to actually pick a fight about it has to be, I don't think it has to be anything. But what has to happen is that we adults have to take responsibility. And we cannot leave this um, to some uh, marketing discussion. And we surely cannot leave it to someone deciding what somebody else, so someone other than their own children deserve. This is about a common goal, a common society. So um, as you can see, I'm gracefully ducking <laughs> precisely what it is that the federal government should do. because. The federal government is one player, but they're not the only players. But we have to get invested in, in delivering. I think one thing, you know, and again, I would defer to the experts on this. I'm just a filmmaker. But um, <laughs> just, I, just I think, a filmmaker. Yeah. But I think um, you know, one thing that I have seen from the field and one thing that I do think, um, you know, an area, the early childhood education piece is something that I think across all political lines, I think there's agreement that there needs to be robust support for that. And I think that particularly affects uh, my community, the Latino community, um, the low income community. So I think investments in early childhood, I, I think that that's, I, I don't know how we can have an argument about that at, at this stage. So that, that's something I'd You'd be I'd surprised. Like this is Washington. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of arguments. No. <laughs> Dennis. Well, you know, one of the roles that the federal government has traditionally played is the equity issue. So, for example, special ed kids weren't in school 40 years ago. Um, and they played a role to say, wait a minute, we're ignoring the populations. Uh, kids of, of migrant workers were not being educated, and they stepped in. So I think one of the roles that the federal government has to continue is this equity role. And I think that is probably one of the most important things. In Finland, they don't have a word for accountability. They have it. Their word is responsibility. And I wish we would change the order in which we discuss three questions. Everybody wants to talk about the how and the where, and they're at the, the activity level. I think that one of the things that the federal government has to talk about is why we want and need a public education system. If you had to define what is the purpose of public education in America in the 21st century, what would you say? I hope it's more than finding a job. I mean, jobs are important. I have one, too. But as my grandkids are in school, or when my sons were in school, I, it wasn't just about finding a job. It's about a person. And we have to talk about what is it that we want to accomplish. That's the most important question. That, what is it that we want for all children in America? The second question then is, how can we make that happen? And there's, there's a lot of rhetoric about that, what we want for all kids, but we don't really talk about what do we need to do. If you come from a high poverty area, do you have different obstacles than another? How do you plan to overcome those? It's not an excuse. You can't ignore it. What do you plan to do? The third question is what are the resources needed to do that? 
Too often that becomes the first question and we argue about money and we don't even know why we're doing this or what it is we're trying to accomplish. And the federal government, I think, has a really important role in that why question. They have to be the bully pulpit that says this is why, as a nation, education has always been part of what we call the foundation of a democracy, of an educated citizenry is absolutely essential. Define how we believe we can do that in partnership with states uh, and then figure out the resources that are needed and, and, and put them there. I mean, this system, we always talk about the public education system, but think about what it is. We have a federal government that gives about 14% of the money and a lot of policies. You have 50 different states. You have 14 to 15,000 school districts and over 90,000 buildings. That's the system. And so one of the things that I think the federal government can do is to bring sanity to the discussion to talk about what do you have to do to change that system? It's not about one program or this program. It's about actually impacting that system and does it provide what we say we want for all children? And the answer to that is no, then you must come up with a solution to counter that obstacle. And if I may, Dennis, just to extend that, in the same sort of lens, 7% of what is available to the higher education system is supplied by the federal government. But the framing of the premise of what's the social contract, that's, that is the federal role, even if we bicker about the effectiveness of federal behavior right now. When you mentioned the Common Core Standards, this is an incredible feat that we accomplished in the United States. 45 states agreed on what every child should know. Those standards are critical and really important, and they're in some states, it's a very large leap from where they were. Now we're to the implementation. And it will, it must, there are some kids who are going to have a really hard time in the first two to three years of reaching those standards. But what we can do is point fingers and say, why aren't they there? What we have to do is to say, what's stopping them? What is it that we need to do differently, more of or less of, to ensure that every child can get that? Because that's what it should be. That is the goal. And so I, the Common Core Standards, to me, that was the easy part, even though it was the most, we've never done it before. Now we have to figure out a way to implement that in 90,000 buildings, 15,000 school districts to make sure that every child gets their opportunity to achieve them. But there's recent pushback against those, those standards. Yeah. There's this whole momentum. There are a bunch of states who now are voting to defund them. They don't want to go ahead with them. They're being propelled by Tea Party folks and others to the right who say this is federal overreach and we, we never want the federal government to intrude on local decision making and well, we know our kids best, our school districts know our kids best, we don't need bureaucrats in Washington directing what's going on locally. So Those same state decisions decided that kids of color didn't need an education. And it wasn't, if it were not for the federal government stepping in, that, that would have continued. Um, I don't understand, I really don't understand the motivation of someone who can argue that it's not important for all children to be able to achieve these standards. Why, why do you believe that in some state they should be lower than in others? How in the world do you compete in this global society when you handicap certain kids? I think the national interests of having an educated citizenry is high enough that it's not telling you how to do it. All it's saying is, and by the way, they're not federal standards. That's the one most important point. 45 states agreed to the same standards. That's not a federal mandate. They agreed. And now some of them want to take that out. They are not for kids. That I'm sure of. Because it handicaps certain kids. And so you can't say, I'm for kids, and I don't think we ought to have common core standards. I, I think those are contradictory. And, and this is one of the reasons why I'm excited to see the finished product and to know how it's going to be broadcast. Because um, the space between the kind of conversation we're having right this second and the reality of the young people that are featured in this film and the lives of hundreds of thousands of young people right now is what is at stake. And our capacity to, to build political will, collective will, to deliver is really what is this enterprise. And um, I ducked on the federal role partially because we are churning on that. 
But whatever is the decision, we have a standard, and that standard is to provide young people with the means to thrive. And that is done through education, and it's done through public education. And right now, the arc goes beyond high school completion. It's into college. And to pretend otherwise in any conversation is, is irresponsible. And so the reality of what we have to work with and then actually doing it in real communities, that's hearts and minds. And as your point already, that's not told as much as I live in the world of facts and policy, that's not told there as effectively as when you really are thinking about people. And so the opportunity to, to see this film, but also then my busy mind is leveraging when it comes out and what works in the places where it's working and what has helped the graduates that, that are going to be featured to thrive and how do we use those as examples. Sure. I want to get down from that uh, you know, 10,000 feet level to just what you're talking about, Sarita, because I was looking at some, there was some polling that uh, the Gates Foundation did of, of high school dropouts and nearly half the kids who dropped out said that they did it because their classes weren't interesting. And about 80% of dropouts said that they would have liked to see their schools offer more real world learning opportunities. So I wonder, Bernardo, if you can tell us from your experience in the field, does that ring true to you? Is that or those reasons uh, w that were propelling those kids uh, you know, uh, out of school? What, what do you know? It actually absolutely does, but, but I guess with a twist. And one of the things that we kind of developed, uh, I mean, anecdotally, is that um, students who are engaged in kind of leadership roles in their schools or who had some participation beyond just being passive learners and um, tended to, to do better. And so the, those students that we profiled who uh, got involved in peer juries, uh, became in, in, involved in, um, you know, in, in different ways. I mean, really what we were talking about is civic engagement. So those students who were involved in more than, in, you know, in helping shape the communities that they were a part of, those students did tend to perform uh, very well. So I think, you know, if there's a through line through the six stories that, that we've created in this, in, in this series, it's, it's really the value of civic engagement and, and really involving students in a process that goes beyond just um, being test takers, uh, really, really turning them into uh, critical independent thinkers or giving them the resources to do so. So I think that, that idea of dropouts um, not being necessarily engaged, not being fully engaged as, as people, as, as persons, as you were saying, I think is, is really critical. And often two times, I mean, public schools are uh, unbelievably stressed uh, spaces. My mother's a teacher of high school Spanish. She's been teaching for nearly 40 years. She's still uh, stubbornly teaching. Um, you know, it, it's, um, it's an exhausting job. It's not something that I would wish on anybody. At the same time, um, it's, uh, you know, it's a place where you, you can absolutely turn lives around. Um, and so I would say um, that the places that I, I saw in, in my field research that seemed happiest <laughs> and seemed to be performing the best were the places where student input was solicited. Dennis, thoughts about this? I think we have to talk about two different things. When they, quote, drop out and when they leave. They leave often in 9, 10, or 11th grade, but they dropped out before up here. And one of the most important things is that we do the interventions that are necessary, and I don't think we do a good job of that at all. I mean, the most we do is we talk about whether a student needs to repeat a grade. Do the same thing again and then expect different results. Einstein says that's the definition of insanity, by the way. Um, we all know that if a student does not read well by the end of third grade, the probability of them successfully completing school plummets. So to me, the question ought to be starting, well, first of all, early childhood. We have to focus on that. That is the most important solution that we as a nation could institute. There is no grade in school where there's a greater range of ability in a classroom than kindergarten. Not in my high school math classes. They were much more homogeneous in terms of ability. Um, so we need to start with the early childhood. But then we need to do the interventions. What, what breaks my heart is when you hear a first or second grade teacher say, I can tell you right now who's not going to make it. And then the follow-up question I have is then, what did we do differently for those kids than the rest? And if the answer is nothing, I think that's malpractice and malfeasance. 
How dare systems know that a child is at risk and not do something about it? It's like going to the doctor and they say, you're really in trouble, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. <laughs> no, I don't want that from my doctor. Um, so those kids that get behind and they're not feeling success, that is a hard life to lead. When you're in third and fourth and fifth and sixth grade and you don't get the math and you don't do well in English, what is it that keeps you going? You need that. And the kids that are involved, whether it be drama or athletics, I mean, people you say, the only reason he goes to school is to stay in football, good. I'll keep, as long as he's in my classroom, I don't care if his main motivation is football. I want him in my room because that's the only way he, I have an opportunity to give him what I believe he needs to succeed. So it's that intervention early on in ensuring success uh, that would have a huge impact on the dropout problem. Sarita, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I mean, I, I think that the, the, um, the premise of why students disengage from school, um, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. Um, wanting to think about how do we build on what we know and, and reach those students. Um, I'm very privileged to know really amazing leaders throughout this country. Um, one that comes to mind right now is the superintendent of a very um, uh, impressive school district. Um, in South Texas, which has one of the highest poverty levels of any set of counties in the country. And this inspired leader, when thinking about dropouts, rather than um, um, do things in conventional ways, took an innovation, since you mentioned the Gates Foundation, that they've been promoting called Early College and said, I don't, uh, don't want to just do this, which bridges uh, the opportunity for high school students to start taking college courses, which in and of itself, in a fragile school district, um, with students who are sometimes the first in their family to even reach high school, um, was already a stretch. He chose, and the gentleman's name is Danny King, um, uh, Dr. King chose that strategy for dropouts. And with an enormous um, innovation and direct partnership with the community college and the university in the area, is now not only recapturing those students, but he's producing in very short order students who are earning associate degrees. I only raise that to say there are real strategies um, with real faces behind them, and we know them. They can be deployed. And what I'm really anxious for is for us to use accountability, but to use it pretty publicly and to start challenging districts, communities across the country to use these innovations, not, not just to say it you know, in a speech, but to actually start producing it. We keep hearing that that's important for our economy, but so far, um, the equity issue, we're still very comfortable leaving those as sort of boutique, leaving those as the isolated, and just letting um, vast numbers of young people move through our system. And, at some point, I'd like to believe that forces will compel, but until it does, creative will, creating the will, that's, that's what I'd like to tap. How about this strategy? Um, Kentucky just decided to raise its, uh, the age at which you can drop out of school from 16 to 18. Now, legally, you can't leave school before you're 18. You're, you're, that's Kentucky's solution, and Montana is debating whether to do something similar, and there are a couple of other states that, are, that, have, that have tossed this out as a, as a solution. What do you all think of that? I think it's a good idea if you do something with it. You can't simply change the graduation requirement for age, do everything the same way, um, and expect different results. But I do believe that a higher graduate, or age for uh, compulsory education is a good idea, and then we need to say, and if we have them two years longer, what is it that we need to do differently? And what, how would we rearrange their educational life? Um, and then I think there's real possibilities that can come forward. Uh, Bernardo, I wonder whether you can share with us um, uh, what you learned from this problem when you made these these films. Your mom is a longtime teacher. You obviously know a lot about this. You had some insights before you began the project. But I wonder if you learned anything 
from from this that you could share with us? That sure. I mean, one of the one of the goals in the storytelling of this project was to have the the students be the drivers of the storytelling themselves, at least as much as possible. So, you know, the American Graduate Initiative initiative overall is a look at um, the the dropout issue. Um, and you know what we wanted to look at was well what is forcing what is pushing students out of the system what is causing students to drop out um, and I but I really wanted it to be rooted in their voices as much as possible as you know one of our jobs as documentary filmmakers or as journalists is to listen you know is not to not to go in and, and impose an idea but rather to kind of absorb and and let those um, you know let the the, the so-called characters drive the narrative itself and I. I think I'll, I'll, I'd go back to what I said earlier. I think if there was one through line in all of these stories, uh, whether it's a young woman becoming pregnant in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, you know, in her sophomore year, or whether it's someone uh, leaving a gang in San Diego in the Logan Heights barrio, um, you know, what connected all of those stories is when they began, when they had opportunities and supports, they had support networks to. Um, help them define their own educations, their futures. When they, they had a kind of robust support, plus you know your 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 idea matters, your opinion matters. You can help shape the community that you're a part of. That we really saw um, a shift in their educational outcomes that way. So I mean, I think in some ways the the series is is really an argument for civic participation, civic engagement. You know, no matter what what it is being involved in, in, in more ways than one in your community, in, in your school. And I thought what Sarita was saying was, was really fascinating about, was it in Brownsville or in? in it's, a, it's in Brownsville, it's in McAllen, in it's McAllen. in Edinburgh, yes. That kind of reframing of, of what happens with dropouts, the same thing uh, I saw in San Diego with Reality Changers, again, where um, they kind of reframed the question to, uh, from, you know, why aren't, you know, why aren't you staying in school to where are you going to college? You know, re something as simple as reframing the kind of potential for a student it was, it was really valuable. But I, I think what I saw, and, and this was a very organic process, it's not some, an idea that I began with, was the idea of really of civic engagement. The more involved students are in their, in their learning, the, the kind of more power they seem to have, the, 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 the greater the, the outcome seems to be. And the people driving that support or supplying that support are the classroom teachers, or the it's the school district, or where, where is that where is that coming from? In some cases, it's superintendents. In some cases, it's classroom teachers. Oftentimes, it's outside organizations. It's former classroom teachers disaffected for one reason or another, and, and starting nonprofits that can then go and support uh, those schools. It can come from a, a number of different um, organizations. I mean, one story we feature in Chicago was about a, a you know, pilot program of a, a peer jury where all of those peer jurors, all of those students went on to take leadership uh, roles in, in their school uh, and it really kind of turned a lot of students, kept them in school. So I think it can be a number of different, um, you know, d different organizations, different people who can play that role of bringing students uh, in, to the table. So it sounds to me like it's not coming from the state or from any federal program, it's organic and it's on the ground. It's coming it's from the community. Right. It, it means listening to the community and listening to community leaders and, and not having a top-down approach all the time. And as we think about going to scale um, <coughs> when the uh, broadcast is available, uh, one of the curiosities that, that my organizing uh, wants to do is, and the, the people, the spark plugs and the leaders, to ask them what helps you do this work? What is it in the environment? What is it in federal policy? What is it in state policy? Who are the businesses that are leading you? How do you, because the, the capacity to do this kind of work begins with real people that, that we'll get to know, <coughs> but the, the pace at which that has to take fire take, and, and light up this country is such that um, I, I worry when it is seen as the heroic singular person because then we're going to stay in that sort of isolated way. And this is about delivering, delivering in a very large scale. Bernardo, of the six uh, characters that you, that you followed, can you tell us how many are actually going to, are heading to college, do you know? All of them are en route to graduate. The majority are headed to college. That wasn't by design either. I mean, I, as a filmmaker, you are looking for drama, you know, not reality style drama. I'm not, tr <laughs> not trying to make teenagers cry on camera. 
but <clears throat> I have worked for MTV, so I have had <laughs> Sorry, Viacom, I, I work for public media, public interest television. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I do think that, um, so, you know, extraordinarily, they're, they're all headed in, in, uh, in that direction. And one of, one of the stories in San Diego uh, was, was what you were saying, is a, a young man who come up through, the, through a gang and is now back in the community serving as an educational leader and as a mentor. And that has been a very kind of profound and, and powerful um, you know, story. So someone who's, who's really connected to that community teaching again. So that, that's an important piece there too. Yeah. Using this film as leverage, as you said, is so powerful. I mean, I, I think the power of the, I mean, the film itself is well done, but the real power that we can use is to show that to groups of people and after seeing it, then the most important part comes to say, what is it that we could do in our community together to deal with those kinds of issues that these kids, real people, are having? And that discussion is the one. I, I believe that if, if all of the adults that worked in a school, along with community people, came together and decided what they, number one, what do we want for the kids in our neighborhood, in our school? Number two, what are we willing to do this next year to try and make that happen? And then they implemented it. I believe you could transform the world. I, because if they believe in it and they do it, it will make a difference. But it's having that conversation and bringing people together to uh, decide on what positive steps they are willing to do uh, to make a difference. Um, I wonder, I'm not sure, can I get a show of hands in the audience here? How many folks are uh, connected to education in some way? Do we, okay, oh, wow, okay, a good number, okay. And how many are just film goers who stumbled into this session? <laughs> okay, all right, welcome everybody. Um, so I think what, what I'd love to do is we've got, um, got some great minds here and I'd love to uh, open it up to some questions um, from the audience and we can have an exchange here with our panelists. Um, so I, uh, the lady in the pink here, right up front. <laughs> so um, I just find it fascinating, um, having, uh, I teach at the College of Graduate Rockwell level, but I think it's interesting, my, my cousin has two children who are in the past and she's been told repeatedly throughout the education, the public school education system, that her children will never get to college. And she is just hell-bent to have her children go to college, and I have no doubt in my mind that they'll go. And so what, what's amazing to me is that she's changed the language. She's changed it from can't to you will be going, and the kids, you ask them, you know, they'll tell you where they're going to college. And secondly, she, she has altered their education experience to be able to accommodate them right where they are and to move them ahead at their pace. And she said, you know, it may take them 10 years to get to college, but they're gonna get to college. So my question is, with so much that we do in our society, you know, you can pick a video game that meets your specific needs. You can get into your car and have it mold itself to you. And yet the education system still seems to be behind the fact that there are various learning modes and people feel comfortable learning in different ways and yet we're not accommodating these children. They're dropping out of school because it's not interesting to them. It's not, it's not meeting them where they are, and it's, and it's trying to impose something that's form-fitting on people that aren't fitting in that form. And so my question, I, and I think more directed to you, is what kinds of things are we, are we stressing with teachers and principals to get them out of their comfort zone to say, you have to lecture, you have to do it this way, you have to do it this way, to really try to make it a one-off and, and meet your specific needs. Two things I would say in response. Number one, one of the reasons that happens, I believe, is because we deal with the monetary question first. We decide how much money, and then we design a system that we can do with that amount, and that's backwards. We have to decide what we want to achieve for students, how we're going to do it, and then put the resources to accomplish that. Uh, what we do specifically as an organization, I believe very strongly that as practitioners, you can't change a system without involving and engaging the people in the system. It's impossible. From our, my point of view, for those of us in my organization, I believe we have two responsibilities. One is I think we need to point out things that we believe do not help students. And number two, after we say no to that one, and we say, and here's what we need to do instead. We have to generate our own solutions and not wait or depend on others to come up with those. And th that to me is really a, 
a priority for us as an organization as we move forward to define the solutions for the for the interventions, for the differences in the way kids learn. We do that, but not to the extent we should. Other questions? All the way in the back. Thank you. Uh, Bernardo, can you just remind us of the broadcast date? Sure. And can either you or maybe somebody from ITBS tell us a little bit about the scope of the project? Because it's much more than just the English language film. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so the graduates will air nationally on PBS October 28th and November 4th on uh, the wonderful series Independent Lens. Um, we'll also have either a simultaneous or nearby a Spanish language broadcast with all kinds of resources for Spanish speaking uh, families and students and organizations. So there'll be a, a kind of robust outreach to the, to the Latino community and the Spanish language community. And we're right in the middle of working at the details of how that will be implemented. And our day-to-day -day production partners are ITVS, the Independent Television Service, Great, great partners. They're doing. Uh, they'll be doing managing the engagement campaign. I worked with them on my last film, which was about um, uh, journalists covering organized crime in Mexico uh, and the deaths of journalists there. Uh, almost less controversial than education, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, and so, uh, but we're really excited to be working with ITVS on this as well. And if there's someone, if there's a representative from ITVS here who would like to talk about that, that'd be great. But, uh, okay. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Ming Lo. I'm an education activist, so... Oh, and I'm a pretty loud speaker, but yes. Uh, um, as I said, um, I'm an education activist, and so um, I have two quick questions around uh, the uh, uh, civic engagement and related concepts around volunteering and also leadership. But it, just a quick answer, perhaps, for should volunteerism be required if not, how best to encourage civic engagement, leadership, and all the um, uh, suite of, of which help lead to keeping people in school and become educated in more than just the academic sense. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So should volunteerism and, be required? And traveling with his own soundtrack. I like that. <laughs> I like that. You know, I think it's an interesting question because one, one of the stories that we profile is about an undocumented student. It's very, you know, very um, fitting after the Jose Antonio Vargas presentation. But um, I have this student in Georgia who um, almost dropped out because once he was aware of his legal status, uh, like so many students, just felt hopeless. And, and, and uh, in, in Georgia, where there is a ban uh, on undocumented students at the top five research universities, in that state, he, he saw his friends who had maybe done not as well as, as he had academically going off to state university, and he couldn't go. So he worked at a gas station for a couple of years. Through a network of community activists, he found out about Freedom University in Georgia, which was an initiative started by five, uh, four or five professors who decided to donate their time every Sunday, four hours, to teach college level classes to undocumented students to keep them academically engaged. Um, no credit for the students, no uh, salary for the teachers. It's just uh, an initiative just to keep them academically engaged, keep them reading. While that's happening, the professors are also helping them apply to universities and colleges across the country. We're starting to see a lot of um, scholarships for undocumented students. That's, that's, that's bubbling up. So in the case of the student that we profiled, Gustavo Madrigal, he ended up uh, getting um, a full scholarship, all tuition paid for four years at a school university here in the Northeast. Um, you know, when we talk about volunteerism or we talk about community engagement, I mean, here's a student who became very engaged in his community, got very involved with the Dreamers. That is a type of civic engagement um, that is, you know, it's, it's, um, it's very organic. It, it just, it sprang out of necessity there. So I think wherever we can identify places where um, there is an issue that's really, um, really affecting students and communities, and we can create support so that they, uh, students can become involved in, you know, in, in those communities. I think the more support we create for that, um, the, the, you know, the better the outcomes will be. Same thing in Chicago through the peer jury system. I, really, I, I watched some really kind of radical transformations of students uh, when, when they became involved in um, deciding on, on, on punishments for minor infractions for, for other students that had previously been decided upon by the administration. So I mean, th to me as a filmmaker, those types of things really 
really excited me. So I'm, I'm uncomfortable saying that anything should be mandated or you know, that it should be. Um, it's also how that plays off with a low income community and a wealthy community that you know, there, there's so many different factors there. But what I would say is creating organizations and supports for, for, for people who are dealing with issues like legal status or like uh, crime, I, I, I think that that's an exciting thing. Other questions? Yes. This is a question for all of you, but, but especially Janice. Um, as, part of the, as, as part of the conversation about um, accountability, or as you put it, uh, responsibility, uh, do you think that metrics around graduation um, should play into a review of a district or, or even of individual teachers? Um, and, and how do you consider that metric with regards to standardized testing, for instance, as, as an alternative to measure, measuring performance and educator performance? I think there have to be multiple measures. Uh, as a math teacher, I spend a lot of time with my students trying to get them the difference, to know the difference between just looking at data and doing an analysis of that. One of the problems when people just look at numbers is that they assume that if there's a high correlation between two factors, that there's also a cause and effect, which can lead you really down a bad path. The example in my class I'd always use is that if we did a study of all the people involved in a car accident in the last 12 months, my guess is that over 90% of them probably either have a cavity or a filling. So there's a very high correlation, almost one to one, that if you're involved in a car accident, you also have a cavity and or filling. I doubt if you could show that there's any cause and effect there. So collecting data is really important. The second part is analyzing that and saying, what does it tell us? And then the third aspect of that is, I think you have to decide what are the things that you need to know in order to make good decisions about interventions with students. So in countries, uh, the leading countries of Finland and Singapore, they do a lot of what they call active research, where it's not done by somebody on the outside, but it's people within the system saying, what data do we want to gather? Because based on that, we need to do these things. So I think there's a huge place for data collection, data analysis, but it's got to be done with a purpose in mind, not just looking at numbers. I hope I answered your question. And the same sort of reasoning applies at the college level, at the university level. Um, I, I think that uh, it's very likely that there's going to be all kinds of opportunity to co continue to explore this issue of quality. Um, you know, um, the, the, the most prestigious institutions in our country have very high graduation rates. They also have exquisitely prepared students, often who come um, with limited financial need, um, and that's um, a f so. In terms of interpreting the data, um, the the issue of quality at institutions that um, are open admission is what we're very interested in. Um, the ability to use data to see the impact of what a curriculum, um, a very robust student affairs program, um, a very well-grounded relationship between that institution and the community. Um, those are the kinds of things that we're looking at, but we're not gonna duck on this notion that students who start a program, they usually wanna finish. And whether it's they're getting a high school diploma or they get an associate's degree or they get you know, a bachelor's degree or, um, I would love for students to start thinking about a graduate degree. I'm very concerned about future faculty in this country um, and having a faculty for our American institutions that look like the world in which we live, which is people of color. Um, so I think completion is a legitimate way to assess the impact, but it is something that we have to really look at who goes in and what are their characteristics, and then really what are our ability to say, and this is what we do with them. Meeting them where they are and helping them meet their goals. Thank you. All the way in the back, you've had your hand up for 10 minutes, so. Hi, I'm Francisco Alvarez. I'm uh, actually just an undergraduate student here at GW, but I'm already, uh, I would say, an education activist. Um, <laughs> for me, um, an engaged classroom starts with quality teachers and I was I was curious what role do I mean I'll be extrinsic uh, rewards such as loan forgiveness programs and perhaps high, slightly higher starting pay uh, play in attracting and retaining talent 
to a profession in education. I mean, as a young person, I see many bright students at leading universities who have contemplated a career in education, but given, you know, they look at the life they'd like to live, quote unquote, and a lot of like the starting pay and, and then they say limited advancement options, they don't look at teaching as something feasible in the long term and often think that maybe Teach for America will, will do and if they want to do something else, they'll have to consider our options. Dennis, he's singing your song there. Go ahead. <laughs> Teach for oh, pay. Man. <laughs> You're singing my song is right. Number one, I believe very strongly that once students are in the classroom, the teacher makes a huge difference. Number two, I think it is absolutely wrong for anyone to be placed in the classroom as a teacher of record who is not adequately trained and licensed. You can't cut hair without a license, but you can teach 30 kids and be responsible. That's wrong. As I've looked at what you talked about, how do you build up the, uh, we don't have a recruitment system, but how do you build up so you have plenty of people who want to go into that profession? In our country, we spend a lot of time talking about individual compensation compared to others. When I look at the other places in the world where they are being successful, they don't look at compensation that way. They look at it as undergirding the whole system. Example. So for example, in Singapore, what they would say is every two, three to five years, they do an analysis of the private sector versus public sector, and they want to keep those salary ranges comparable. So what you said, I'd like to go into teaching, but I don't want to make $35,000. What they do is they keep them all comparable. So those who want to go into teaching have an opportunity to say, is this my profession? So that's the first thing. You've got to build in that equity. I was a math major. So do I go into engineering, accounting, actuarial science, or teaching of mathematics? In their system, the way they view that system is all of those compensation-wise should be comparable and then I choose based on what I really want to do. That's one thing. Second thing is we really have to take serious the training and preparation for people to be a teacher. It is a profession. It's not an assembly line work. I, I was talking to a CEO the other day and I said, how many, how many people do you have as direct reports? And he said, 11. And I said, is that high? And he said, oh, yeah, well, that's a lot. I said, you know, as a high school math teacher, I had 160 direct reports. I saw them every single day, and I had to give them feedback on their performance every single week. Do you do that for your 11? He said, no. And I said, so the job of a teacher is far more of a management position. You're managing resources, time, and personalities, and people. So if your training isn't building you up for that, like cultural competency, you grow up in a small town in Iowa, and you start teaching in a large city, and 95% of your kids are students of color. Are you culturally competent? Do you know what you need to know in order to be successful? So I believe that it is a real profession. We ought to treat it as one in terms of compensation, and we ought to treat it as one in terms of understanding what the kind of training you need. And then from day one until the last day you're in the classroom, it ought to always be about growth. How do I become more successful in my professional practice? And it's not about a test score. Anyone who believes that you can measure what I do in a classroom in a three hour period on one day of the year is wrong. And anyone who believes that anyone with a degree in math can do what I do in a classroom is wrong. It's more than content. It is a set of professional skills. You need to learn those and you ought to have at least a competent level of those before you are ever given the responsibility to educate a group of children. Other questions all the way at the end? Yes. Hi. Yes. Here comes the mic. I was just wondering, there's a lot of attention with respect to STEM in education curriculum. And I, my question is, how do you all think that the arts and humanities can help address the uh, dropout rate Excellent in curriculum? Question. One thing we do is we put the A in there so it's STEAM instead of STEM. Uh, and the arts have to be in a school. The idea that math and reading and language arts are the only two things that are important is crazy. And there are so many students who need arts, want arts, and that's their ability, and they do tremendous work. And we need to celebrate and provide that to students. Uh, 
I am awed and amazed in high schools and elementary schools across this country when you see what kids do in the arts, whether it be the visual arts or music or drama. And for us to deny that for those kids, not everybody wants to go in the content areas. So I, it shouldn't be a question of whether or not we have it. It ought to be a given. And I, also think, oh, and I also think that, that uh, you will find uh, people in STEM, you will find industry leaders, you will find uh, engineers and scientists who will reinforce that statement, that um, the role of the liberal arts, um, the role of social sciences, the role of the arts uh, in their capacity to produce is very high. But I do think it's how investments get made. Um, and that, um, unfortunately, in some of these discussions, we're pitting disciplines, um, what's going on within state public education. Um, there's all kinds of curricular battles underway where um, let's, let's get rid of certain disciplines. Let's, let's take, a, take these out of the offerings because they're not going to lead to jobs. And so Dennis already made a reference to this. I think that the ability to understand what is the role in terms of a student's holistic approach to their skills. Um, there are advocates, but I think at this point, it's not just the advocates in the arts, uh, it's also the advocates in the very field of STEM that will say why we, we don't want to banish this from the curriculum. No, I would just say, I mean, as you were patting me on the back, I was thinking about my, my own high school experiences, and I actually attended three different high schools because I struggled as a high school student. I went from a rural public school to a public school in New York and then a, you know, and, and a religious school. But I, I was thinking about the role that arts education played in my life, and it obviously had a huge impact on, on what I've gone off to do. One of the students that we profile in Lawrence, Mass., which is a majority uh, Latino city, um, uh, you know, was, was bullied for, for coming out at, in his sophomore year. For, um, and one of, you know, one of the very few students who came out publicly that he was gay, bullied terribly, and very, very slowly became involved in the um, drama and dance departments at his school. At first, he was nervous that that drama department would make him even more of a target. But it was that space, that was, that was his space of engagement where he you know, gained confidence and really kind of really uh, took on a, a kind of personality and a community and is now, you know, this, this really kind of this dominant force as a senior going off to graduate. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, there are arguments on the, on the data side of things, but I think just on a, on a very personal level, I feel like that's, um, it's so critical. And to even think about, um, you know, not putting resources there to me, is, you know, it's just, it's just depressing, but, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. The lady on the end here in white. Yes. Oh, okay. Here's the mic. Um, there there are actually five what you call STEM schools that are being studied now by George Washington University. And what is happening in those schools, they're, they're being studied because they're so successful. You know, they, they're poor, you know, they come from poor communities, they come from um, uh, high Latino or high minority schools. And what is, what they are not looking at is the engagement of those kids in the community. The fact it's not the STEM that's getting them through and graduating them and making them successful. It's because the whole community has wrapped themselves around it. You know, the kids have become involved in um, the, the hospital or the farms or they're learning about things that are important to them. And the teachers are teaching to that and they're passing those SOLs. I was a teacher of all the, you know, all of all the ED, LD, Asperger's, everybody, you know, in the school in a, in a, a gang community. I got those kids engaged by collecting cicadas and doing a research study with a California school college that wanted, you know, the collection for a biomass study for trees. You wouldn't believe the engagement of those kids. Guess what? None of those kids, none of those classes had ever passed their SOLs. Every single one of my classes for those five years, half of those kids passed the SOLs. They were engaged. And because they got engaged with people who cared about them, who, who got them, publicity, they got on TV, 
They That's really talk to people. A recipe for, That's for it. success here, which is That's what we've it. been talking about for That's the last it. hour. Okay. I just want to thank everyone for coming in. Can we please give a round of applause to our panel? October 28th and November 4th on All Independent right, Lens in. on PBS. Thank you.